Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar, Integrated Census and Survey Data for Aging Research, an introduction to IPMS. Today's webinar is in conjunction with the GSA 2021 Annual Scientific Meeting and hosted in partnership with the Network for Data Intensive Research on Aging Initiative at the University of Minnesota's Life Course Center. The webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the GSA website. A notice to all attendees will be distributed once the recording is available. A question and answer session will immediately follow the live presentations. We will be accepting questions through the questions feature accessible on the right hand side of your screen. Also located there is a downloadable handout for today, a copy of the presentation slides. So opening today's program is Dr. Sarah Flood, Director of the U.S. Microdata Project at IPMS and Associate Director of the Life Course Center at the University of Minnesota. So without further delay, I'll hand the microphone to Sarah. Thank you, Judy. Good afternoon. As Judy said, I'm Sarah Flood. Um, I am a research scientist at IPMS, and I serve as the Director of U.S. Surveys and Associate Director of the NIA-funded Life Course Center. With me today is my colleague, Dr. Lara Cleveland, who's the Director of IPMS International at the University of Minnesota. I will give the first half of our presentation and then turn it over to Lara, who will talk about the microdata available in IPMS for aging research and give you a brief guided tour of IPMS International. Uh, we're grateful to GSA for providing this opportunity for us to share our work at IPMS with the community of GSA researchers. And thank you to Judy and your team for all of the, the work you've done to make this possible. I also want to quickly acknowledge the generous support we've received from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and the Gates Foundation uh, and the IPMS data collection we're about to share with you uh, is a result of a shared effort over nearly three decades by many current and previous colleagues. And we're just the fortunate representatives who get to share IPMS with you today. Um, so as the title says, we'll, we will provide an introduction to IPMS and how you can use the census and survey data we integrate in your aging related research. This is a roadmap of the four main topics we will cover today. Uh, we will pause throughout the presentation for questions and leave time at the end. And as Judy said, please feel free to use the chat to ask questions. So let's start um, with an introduction to the network on, for data intensive research on aging. The NIA funded Life Course Center at the University of Minnesota and IPMS are co-located. Uh, this presentation represents a collaborative effort between the Life Course Center and IPMS. And one of our major initiatives at the Life Course Center is to leverage our close ties with IPMS to launch a network for data intensive research on aging, what we call Endira. Through Indira, we seek to increase research on aging uh, using IPMS data. We have a two-pronged approach to reach researchers who study aging who might not know about IPMS um, or be using IPMS and also IPMS users to think about taking a life course approach in their work or incorporating an aging lens in their work. Our focus today is really on the first of those um, two approaches. So we're going to talk about data, and these are the three sets of data resources that Life Course Center members are developing at IPMS. Integrated microdata from IPMS is the focus of this webinar. IPMS started uh, disseminating census data um, back in the 90s, but over time our collection has grown dramatically as you can see from the figure on the right. Our collection now includes um, U.S. census data, international census data, and several U.S. and international survey data sets, which we'll talk more about. Um, 
Today, the collection includes nearly 3 billion person records. Um, and since these are population level, there are lots of observations on older adults. The second resource for research on aging that the Life Course Center members are developing includes longitud longitudinal data to study early life conditions and the impacts on later life outcomes. So Rob Warren and his team are conducting follow-up surveys of the high school and beyond cohort. Uh, Warren has also worked with the collectors of major, major aging surveys in the United States, um, such as the Health and Retirement Survey and the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study. And what they're doing is linking respondents in those aging surveys to the 1940 census. This provides um, good indicators of familial and socioeconomic conditions during, during early life that can then be used to understand later life outcomes. We're also working with the Census Bureau on the Census Longitudinal Infrastructure Project uh, and linking full count census data to create a multi-generational longitudinal panel. Uh, for the multi-generational longitudinal panel, we're using cutting edge record linkage technology to link individuals and families across the 1850 to 1940 period. The result is a database of millions of individuals um, providing the most comprehensive view of long run changes in life course dynamics available anywhere. We're not gonna talk in any more detail about these resources, but um, they are available from IPUMS and um, we can help you navigate those resources after this webinar. The final resource being developed by Life Course Center members is contextual data. Our colleagues at IPUMS make small area population data more easily accessible to the research community. These data can be used to create measures of neighborhood characteristics or structural racism, for example, at the county, census tract, and census block levels. These data can then be linked to large scale census and survey data to help understand how the places where people live and work impact population health and well being. And before diving into IPUM's microdata, which is what you all came to hear about, um, I want to make a shameless plug for some of the other Life Course Center and IPUM's events at GSA. Uh, Obviously, you're here at this webinar. Um, we also have a research symposium that will be held on November 13th. Um, all of the presentations in this symposium use IPUM's data to look at issues related to aging. We have a virtual exhibit, and um, if you're after this webinar, you're interested and you want to learn more about IPUM's or talk with Lara or me or some of our colleagues, um, we will be holding office hours on November 17th. Those are free and you're welcome to just drop in and chat. Um, we'd love to see you. Okay, so at this point, I've provided some teasers about the, the great things being done by Life Course Center members at IPUMS, but I'm gonna pivot now and focus in specifically on IPUMS microdata, what's available and what we do. So what is IPUMS? We curate, document, and harmonize US and international census and survey data. We make these data available to the research community. Our goal is to improve and simplify access to the world's population microdata, and our focus to date has been on large-scale census and survey data. As I mentioned before, we've been generously funded by NIH and NSF to improve data accessibility. Um, and how we do that is at a high level, we standardize data across time and place so that members of the research community have a, start, a common starting point for their research and they spend more time analyzing data and less time sort of putting it together and getting it ready to analyze. Our work eliminates the need for every researcher to locate multiple data sets and navigate differences in variable names and coding schemes and spend more time 
um, answering pressing scientific questions. We also make documentation available where researchers need it. Um, so we provide documentation at the variable level, for example. And this is so that researchers using census data from multiple countries can quickly know what issues they might encounter making comparisons across countries. Um, you need that information at the variable level, not scattered across um, data sets in separate PDFs. All of the data that, that we work with are um, available to the research community free of charge. And we do a lot of the behind the scenes work, as I, as I alluded to before. So let's talk now about what you need to do to use IFMS. To use IFMS, you, you need to register, uh, and you can do this by visiting ifums.org. And ifums.org is the, the main website where, the main portal where you can access all of our different data collections. And this is where we make all of our standardized data and documentation available to the research community. From IPUMS, researchers can create customized data sets so that they only get in their data set the years and countries of data that they want and only the variables they need for analysis. So if you only need 25 variables, you don't have to get thousands of variables that might be available in the original data. Um, our system creates data sets that um, are specified by researchers. So like I said, you tell us the variables and the samples you want, and we create a data set specifically for you. The researcher then downloads and analyzes the microdata. Um, and we have an amazing user support team who's ready to, to help users via email or via um, a user forum where you can ask and answer questions, browse previous questions that have been asked. And we also have YouTube tutorials, webinars like this, and a set of data training exercises that you can work through to um, make sure that you're understanding the data. So note that thus far I haven't um, talked about actually collecting data. That's because this isn't something we do. We um, repackage publicly available microdata and make it easier to use, um, and we harmonize it across time and place. That said, we do hold some data that are not available anywhere else, including um, several census data sets from IPUMS International that we've uh, worked to recover and um, digitize, and uh, there are also um, full count U.S. Census data sets that we digitized in collaboration with Ancestry.com and the Church of Latter-day Saints. So we're not collecting data, we're making it easier for you to use. So back to what we do. We do harmonization and data delivery. So what is harmonization? Harmonization is the process of creating a single consistent data series uh, from data sets collected at different times and different places. Harmonization is applying a coding scheme to um, group broadly comparable categories uh, across data sets, but retain detail when it's available and documenting these decisions and flagging comparability issues. So we try to tell researchers everything we know about the data we're making available. We want you to know um, things that you should be aware of when you're using the data. And so we do that through documentation. And I want to give you a concrete example here of, of harmonization. So I will, um, this is a simple example of harmonizing marital status in the National Health Interview Survey. So on the left-hand side, what I'm showing you are the seven um, response categories to the question in the National Health Interview Survey about whether, um, about your marital status. This is in the pre-2004 period. You can see that there were seven marital statuses 
um, and the first three married um, are, are variants on married with different um, details about whether the spouse is present or not. In 2004 forward, there was a change. Um, so you can see that in the 2004 forward period on the right hand side, there are five marital status categories. The detail about um, being married on the left is no longer present in the 2004 period. And so what we do during the harmonization process is essentially bridge these changes in variable um, coding schemes and make them consistent across time. We do this using um, custom software. This all happens kind of behind the scenes. And this is what um, you see on our website. So you see harmonized marital status codes in the data that you receive from IPUM. So what we've done is bridged those changes in the um, 2003 and 2004 period um, and preserved the detail that was um, available in the source data, but we ordered the categories so that um, similar categories are next to one another in the variable coding scheme. So in this case, the first digit of the marital status code is consistent across all years. Um, the second digit contains detail specific to the pre-2004 period. So you can see that we haven't lost anything during the harmonization process. Now, this is a simple example, um, but harmonization is a major undertaking. This is a, a massive um, amount of work that we do. And it's especially a, a big body of work when you're harmonizing across um, more than 100 years of data in the case of the US or across dozens of countries in the case of IPUMS International. Uh, and so this is just another view of uh, sort of how we line things up internally. Um, and you can see that uh, um, on the left are those pre-2004 codes, in the middle are those 2004 forward codes, and on the right are the harmonized codes. All we see in the end, again, are um, the harmonized codes. And I am going to pause here and uh, pass the baton to my colleague, Lara. Thank you, Sarah. I'm looking over here. Am I? There we go. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? I think so. Yes. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, I echo the thank you to GSA, our hosts, uh, and I'm happy to be here. And we'll just keep going along with data availability. Uh, I think Sarah has has already mentioned the types of data that we have, but we'll dig in in just a little bit more detail and provide some information about topics to kind of get your research juices flowing, I guess, about what you might be able to do with these data. Um, so this slide uh, details of availability of some of the features of the various data sets. Um, USA 
and the National uh, Health Geographic data, NHGIS, which is shown with the green icon over here, provide decennial census and American community survey data. USA is microdata, and you see NHGIS is aggregate data. Uh, these data go all the way back to the 1790s, so a rich historical uh, collection there. The CPS, uh, Current Population Survey, is U.S. labor force survey that's fielded monthly and includes assorted topical supplements, a rich array of topics in that data set. And we started by uh, working with just one month out of the year to make sure that people had data that's used to measure employment. But over the years, we've added all of the monthly data to that collection. International, IPM's international, the next one, uh, it has high density census microdata files sampled at the household level as are most of our microdata collections so that all of the individuals residing in the household are present. Uh, which makes all of the microdata samples, household samples, a uh, really great source to look at family living arrangements, family structure, interrelationships that impact people's lives over, the, or over their life course. Time use has US and international time diary data. So these are complex data where people report what they were doing in a 24 hour reference period. Uh, sample design is complex. The website for time use is just a little bit more complex accordingly, uh, but I'll talk just a little bit about that when we get to the web demo. Health surveys, so that's uh, there's on the end here, are health surveys, MEPS and NHIS, second to the last icon there includes information on health behaviors, health status, healthcare access and utilization, and healthcare expenditures from the National Health Interview Survey and MEPS. Global Health, listed here with the PMA and DHS uh, abbreviations underneath them, is maternal and child health and fertility planning data from developing countries. Uh, coming from the Demographic and Health Surveys and the Gates PMA Surveys. In the coming year, we will also be adding UNICEF's MIX Surveys, uh, similar types of information from another source. And then the Higher Ed disseminates data on bachelor and doctoral degree recipients with a focus on the STEM workforce in the U.S. And you'll see in the bottom row here, I wanted to point out that almost all of these data sets have information about all ages. Most of them are microdata so you, and have individual age information. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility there to examine uh, people at different ages. Because we have both the census, high density, kind of you can get to you know small, older populations with the census and maybe use that um, to help boost the power of your detailed survey data that might not have the high case counts needed to, to make some inferences or do some research, um, follow up on some research questions. Uh, so really kind of a collection that can be used uh, together or uh, as individual data sets. The uh, health data there, PMA and DHS, although they are primarily focused on women of childbearing age, uh, do have some information about household members uh, and, and so are also maybe uh, can be extended for research beyond what you might first imagine. Just another way to slice these projects, I think Sarah has also made it clear that this includes a range of different types of surveys as well as census data, a high density census samples, full count historical data in some cases, and low level aggregate data, both from the US and internationally. One more view of these projects. And again, I'm gonna go through the next couple slides fairly quickly, but just giving you a taste of some of the types of issues and topics that can be studied using the data available here. If we were in person, these images come from a nice little handout that I think 
summarizes and, and gets you a quick start to figuring out which IPUMS project might be most useful for your research. So marriage, living situations, uh, some mental health and certainly physical limitation information, uh, education and employment available in a lot of these data sets, volunteering, another slice on thinking about topics, uh, include exploring caregiving, there's information uh, maybe particularly in the health surveys but also in some of the other data sets about caregiving activities uh, family co-residents available in any of these household level surveys uh, and censuses information to study relationships also because of that household structure of the samples um, i'll talk a little bit when we look at the website about some enhancements we make to the data of providing uh, variables that point to other members in the household so that you can attach information about one spouse to another or about a parent to children um, or head of household to other members residing in the same house also good for researching health primarily from those health surveys uh, but there is information about disability uh, injury mortality on some of the other uh, data sets as well and all of these have been and can be used to analyze policy outcomes. Uh, many people have used the data bringing multiple sources together, uh, using a lot of population level information from these surveys and censuses, and bringing those together with outside health information, environment information, uh, work information. Uh, so hopefully uh, we're, we're ticking some boxes and, and making you think about what you might be able to do with these data. One more set of examples, uh, just a few bits of work uh, that have relied on IPUM's data sources. The United Nations Population Division draws heavily on IPUM's International for a lot of their work. Uh, here we're showing an example of their World Population Aging Report. Uh, Allendorf used IPUM's DHS to study how increasing numbers of families with only daughters due to low fertil lowered fertility rates, influences patriarchal living systems, including how that influences mothers' expectations for older age support from their children. That's the top article. Uh, and then on the bottom here, uh, Drew and Chu used harmonized uh, NHIS data, that's IPUM's health surveys, to examine trends in injuries among older Americans few different slices on the kinds of research that can be done using the data in IPOMS. Uh, so now that you're thinking about it, uh, we want to lower the barrier to actually using the website to access the data that, that you might be looking for. So hopefully, oh, now I'm back to webinar. And now I think I'm on the website and someone will tell me if I'm not. Um, but here you see the main ipums.org landing page uh, and links to all of the different data projects. Because I direct the IPUMS International Project, I'm going to use that one as our example for today. We'll jump in there and look at how you would build a customized data set. Uh, but know that all of these websites share, share a similar structure. So if you get familiar with one, uh, you just make a couple adjustments for the particular data and you know how to use all of the sites. Uh, in case we want to come back here, I'll jump into another tab. And most of the landing pages look a lot like this. A little description of what, what the website is about um, and hopefully great big links that allow you to jump in and browse the data. Before we do that, I'll point out that each of the pro uh, projects require that you register. Uh, there are separate registrations for each of these data projects. Uh, they have slightly different permissions issues, uh, but some of the fields are shared in common across the registrations to try to lower that burden on users. Some of the international projects uh, have a little bit more requirements, slightly longer research description, 
perhaps a couple more verifications that you agree to store and treat the data responsibly. And this is to honor our agreements with national statistical offices around the world and international survey data collection partners. Uh, but once you've registered, the data are available for free. Uh, some of the app, and uh, we try not to bug you, but we do share a little bit of news. Uh, and we want to make sure that we can contact you if we discover an error in the data or make a rather large change to the data. We also want to be able to tell our funders that people are making use of the data. So we uh, appreciate your registration. There are other tools on the left hand side here, uh, particular to the project, but there is always a section that says support that has links to the user forum, to IPM's help and to tutorials that uh, some of which will describe exactly what I'm going to be showing here today on how to use the website. So if you take a little time to figure out what data you need uh, and then need to come back and can't remember what you learned today, uh, look for the tutorial and you'll be able to find one that shows a similar, similar process. I'm going to jump into browse data or select data um, or browse and select data uh, these all get me to the same page, which is kind of your home page to start navigating. Uh, the documentation on the website is organized not, not so much by data site, but at the variable level. So we're looking here to find the kinds of variables that will inform the topic that we're looking to research. Uh, we also could start by knowing which country in this case, but it might be year or particular data set that you're looking for in other projects um, by changing samples or selecting samples. Variable browsing is organized either by topical theme. So if I want to go look at utilities, which we'll do in a second here, I can jump into one of these topical sections and see what's available. These are household uh, things have measured at the household level in this set of fields, we're looking at things that are measured at the person levels and have individual responses. If I already know the name, the IPOM's name of the variable, I can go search that specifically, or I can use a search field here to look for a, a word or a, a phrase that I'm interested in finding. Uh, so I'm gonna go to utilities. Uh, I'm basing a little bit of my search here on some work that we did when COVID first hit, UNFPA asked IPMS to generate several indicators uh, to take to help the community, the research and UN uh, serving community understand uh, COVID vulnerability. And at the time that was particularly focused on older adults. So they wanted to know what kind of household living conditions and what kind of family living arrangements older adults were living in across the world. Um, so electricity access might be an important um, an important aspect. And look, I left my cart full, uh, so I'm gonna. That's all right. So I've already established here that I want this electricity variable just by checking this box. Um, but I, all of the variable browsing is two, uh, two layers deep here. At this high view, I can see a set of electricity, um, a set of utility variables where they're available. If I had come, I'm gonna go select samples and selected all of the census samples. This would have been our default view when I'm first arriving on the page. Uh, and there are more than 400 census samples here from more than 100 countries and some labor force surveys. So, this browsing is nice to say, oh, let's see, on that top row, if I see an X, electricity is available. It's pretty widely available, not available everywhere. Um, but this is just to provide sort of an overview of where the variable is available. 
If I jump into the variable specifically, I have all kinds of information. So here I'm seeing categories. I'm seeing whether or not that category appears in a particular sample. So the columns are the census samples. Decennial census is here from Argentina, 1980, 91, 2001. I can look at a case count view for these responses. Here I'm seeing unweighted household totals because this is a household variable. Um, and this is just to get you a feel for the sample size, not the representative weights. You want to get the microdata to do your analysis in that way. Uh, I can view a description, brief description in the next tab of this variable, indicating whether the household has access to electricity. And we don't just recode these variables. As Sarah said, we write documentation about what we find as we're harmonizing the variables. Um, there, I could jump down to any one of these and see all kinds of documentation about specific issues, not many, with respect to electricity. But if I look at the general statement, I learn that electricity is generally comparable. In many samples, it's inferred from a question on the source of lighting. Uh, and then some discussion of treatment of gen generators. The specific country comments here will call out things that a user would want to know about that particular country's measurement of electricity and how we at IPUMS handled it when we made the harmonized variable. Universe tab tells you who was asked the question. That's important for things like uh, employment status. You know, at what age did they start measuring or asking people about employment status? And do you need to do any work to align those categories? Uh, another thing that's really useful is access to the questionnaire text. So just to make our browsing a little bit more manageable, I'm gonna filter this down to a few samples rather than looking at all of them. I can uncheck my selection by toggling on and off here. And I'm just gonna take some recent data from these B countries in the 2010 era. And then we'll be back to that summarized view. If I go to the questionnaire text here, I can see that in Bangladesh, this was asking about electricity connection, and it's just a yes or no question. In Benin, it's more like what most countries do. What's your source of lighting? And if there were electric responses here, we coded this as a yes to electricity. I've already added electricity to my cart, but if I wanted to go get other utilities to add, I could add them here, water supply, internet, phone perhaps, and I'm filling my cart with variables. Once I filtered those samples, I'm kind of starting to make a custom request that includes five samples. Uh, the ones listed here. If I want other countries, this will change as I go. Uh, one thing that's helpful, that was helpful in this uh, indicator work we did was knowing the number of persons in the household. So we could look at whether older adults were living alone or with their other family members. Uh, other aspects of the data that really help uh, utilize that family interrelationship information are constructed variables that we create um, that just write the number of the record of the spouse uh, to anyone living in the household with the spouse or the mother and father. So for children, um, this could be adult children or uh, younger children. If their parent is living in the household with them, their record will have the, the record number of that parent, mother or father. Um, Likewise with spouses. It was important for this research we did to have information about relationship, definitely about age at the single year information level, 
sex, marital status. Uh, we wanted to know about education levels and employment status. Uh, and we wanted to do all of that uh, summarizing information at the lowest common geographic level across all of these data sets. And so in IPMS International, we often have second subnational geographic information, and we've created harmonized categories and we provide the individual year categories. So I've selected that. Once I've found what I need for my research, we had to use sort of the, the understood analogy for requesting something, and that is a data cart uh, that you don't have to pay money for. You just sign up. If I'm happy with what I've selected here, I just proceed to create a data extract. I can again review what I've selected. Importantly, I can select a data format. All data by default is delivered as a fixed width text ASCII file uh, with syntax files to read it into a number of statistical packages. If you have a favorite, you can select it. And if you're signed in, our system will remember that that's what you like and submit. So if I want a state data file or SAS or SPSS, uh, I can get that. If I want to use that information about families to know something about other members of the family, um, what is the age of the parent if I have a, an adult head of household? Um, what is the educational attainment status of the spouse that's living with me? I can request that that information be attached. And because we've created those pointer variables, IPMS will just write out that information about the other members of the household as additional variables that usually have underscore mom, underscore pop, or underscore SP uh, to denote what they are. And then if I'm happy, I should make a description. I'm not logged in, so if I try to submit, this is gonna ask me to log in. I'll do that. And then it's useful to write a description. That one's not very detailed, but I'll show you why in a minute. I submit my request for the extract. And now that I'm logged in, I go to my personal request history page. Uh, so the data from the other day when I practiced this demo are available now. It just took a little while for them to load. The request I just made is processing. Uh, it's going to be formatted in for as a Stata file, um, but the code book for this extract I just requested is already here. Um, if I decide I've left out some variables or I want to do the same analysis on some new countries, I can come back to this, hit revise, and go get those things without building this entire request all over again. Uh, so my data will probably be available before we finish uh, this webinar today. Uh, and I would be able to come back here and download it. I would receive an email to my registration email address, letting me know when it's ready. We'll jump back to home while those data are being compiled um, and take a look at the user forum, video tutorials, uh, each project has one of these, and they usually will let you know if you wanted to learn again how to create an account or create a data extract, what we've just learned. Those are available. The main link here is in English, and because we're an international project, we have that information in a few other languages. Um, there's also a lot of information at ipums.org or on each country's website. There's links to the bibliography. You can search and see if other people have used IPMS doing something that uh, is similar or in the, in the area that you're thinking about. 
uh, and again, get a little bit of literature background there or ideas about what, what direction you might want to take for your research. Uh, finally, each of the data sections, uh, where we have been able to add the data to the online tabulator, it is possible to do quite a bit of analysis online. Uh, we, it's a little bit more limited in terms of which countries or which data sets you can pull together, uh, but there's, it's very easy to get some fast tabulations on that online tabulator. Uh, which is often where I'll go to see, once I know, yep, it looks like it's available, then I'll go to the tabulator and do a few cross tabs and say, can I, can I really get where I think I want to go with these data before I go ahead and construct that uh, extract. So that's another useful tool, and there are tutorials about using that online tabulation system. I think I will stop there. Um, I think that's still leaving us a good 15 minutes for questions. Uh, and really appreciate your time and hope that we've gotten you thinking about how you might make use of these data. I see a question in the chat about um, how does one translate the geographic areas into counties or something that is understandable to most people? Um, I believe last time I downloaded IPUM's data from the ACS, it only had FIPS code. So I will uh, take a, a crack at this one um, since I'm more familiar with the US data. So geography is, um, it's a good question. The level of geographic detail available varies um, quite a bit across data collections. And um, so if you are interested, for example, in getting information at the county level, um, that will have to guide which data you're available to use. Um, so uh, the ACS has um, a geography called the Public Use Microdata Area. Um, it's a sub-state level geography. I'm not a geography expert and uh, ACS is not my um, area of expertise, but I know it's sub-state um, and we, our user support team could help you um, learn more about Pumas. Uh, the data sets that I know have county information, um, the CPS identifies counties if, the, um, if there's enough population in that county. Uh, if the number of people in that county is above a certain threshold, um, the American Time Use Survey also identifies counties for some people. Um, other data sets like the National Health Interview Survey um, only have geographic detail available at the region level, so not even state in those data because there's so much information about individuals in those data sets that um, having low levels of geography might pose a confidentiality risk. Um, so anyway, geography is a great question. Um, and, and a really important one. And feel free to, to write in to our IPUMS user email. We should have listed that, ipums at umn.edu, um, or go to ipums.org and you can um, find ways to contact us. Thank you for the question. There's another question um, about whether it's really possible to harmonize everything to the extent that that you want, or so, you know, the marital status example uh, is, is kind of a neat one, where clearly there are three categories of married, and they they fit together, but sometimes you have different. Um, the question just says some things might not be able to be harmonized. How do you handle that? Um, so I think we maybe both could take a little bit of a stab at this, but uh, I have to answer this question quite a bit when I'm out with some of the international folks um, who have seen things measured quite differently because uh, of very specific national circumstances. Um, and my two responses are usually, 
Uh, one, this happens more on international than probably with USA, where some surveys are fairly consistent. Um, but that is the reason for the detailed uh, trailing codes, the composite coding structure that we use, uh, where in international, we often have to really find the lowest common denominator and make a general version. And then we have to make available a detailed version where we can roughly put those things into categories and use the trailing digits to allow us to um, harmonize them. It's also the reason we provide all the comparability text and the access to the questionnaires so that people can trace if they were really looking for a very specific thing, they're able to um, go disentangle whether they think we put something in the right place or not. Uh, so I think um, sometimes we undersell our documentation and it's really rich and we're really hoping that people use it. Um, so it's there on the website. You can take a look. It can write half of your students' papers for them sometimes, I think. Uh, oh, Sarah, that you might know more about this one. What are the surveys that have been linked to 1940? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know for certain that the health and retirement, uh, I know for certain the health and retirement survey, the Wisconsin Longitudinal Study, and I think the, um, the PSID is also linked to 1940. I am not certain about the other two, but I am looking. I will see if I can locate those. I saw a question also about would it be appropriate to visit the IPOMS office hours to learn more about what data you have available on caregiving? You know, that's a great use of IPOMS office hours. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about what you can study related to caregiving. Um, you know, the first question we're going to ask you is are you interested in US or international data? Um, and what do you want to know about caregiving? Like who provides care, what kinds of care, how much time, um, characteristics of caregivers. We're going to ask you a bunch of questions to try to help um, direct you to the, the most appropriate data set to answer your question. And our involvement in some of these more bridging topics like aging or life course, um, that and just because it's a good idea, has led us to, to do some development on cross IPOMS project search capabilities. So those haven't been rolled out yet, but I think we're getting close. So maybe by the next time we do this webinar here, uh, we'll have a few more automated tools for that kind of searching as well. Thank you for waiting for another question. I think we'd also love to say that um, we tout our great user support because we also get a lot of feedback and input from our users. Um, we do, we want to hear from you. <laughs> and part of the reason for this sort of cross project search and many other tools that we've developed has been because our users engage with us and ask us questions and and suggest things that would be useful to them. Um, so as you start looking around, if this has interested you and you do have questions about that or suggestions for how the website is or isn't serving you, uh, we, we really love to, to hear from you. This is a, a living project and we're always trying to build tools uh, that make it easier for researchers to do their research. So that's what we're here for. I will add to that, um, that we also want to hear about problems that you identify with the data. Um, this is very much, a, a um, like Laura said, a living, breathing um, organism each project is, and they continuously evolve. We're always adding new data or um, fixing things. And often those fixes are because users have written to us and said, 
hey, something looks funny with um, these two variables. And uh, so to incentivize letting us know about problems you see in the data, we will send you an IPUMS mug if you find an actual problem in the data. And in some places, IPUMS mugs are highly coveted um, and they're sort of status symbols. So um, use the data, get a mug, and, um, and display it proudly. Great. Well, I just want to take a moment to um, thank Sarah and Lara for the program today. And um, I hope that, uh, and, and, and actually I invite all participants to join us um, on November 10th to the 13th at the GSA 2021 Annual Scientific Meeting Online. Uh, the meeting will be hosted on a state-of-the-art platform that will offer um, a, an engaging, immersive experience, um, allowing you to focus on essential research and networking. So hope to see you all there. And again, a big thank you to uh, our panel and our participants. I uh, really appreciate you all for participating. This is the end of the program. Thank you.